Cool. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Uh, here today with Lisa and Venkat, your co-hosts. Hey, Venkat, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. Right, so today we are talking about the letter P, right? So last time was O and big O notation, and this time it's P. So what are we talking about for P? Uh, so today we're going to talk about probability and potentiality. All right. All right, let, let's... Um, see how we both connect those two topics. That might be an interesting thing to try. So how are, what are the two topics in your mind and how are they connected? Yeah, so my probability, I like to think of is the way of counting. So I, I like to think of probability as being rather backwards looking um, because the way that you arrive at a probability is you count all the ways that things have, might have happened and then you count all the way they did happen over the number of times that you tried, you ran the trial or whatever. And then you get a numerator and a denominator and a fraction, and then suddenly you have a probability. Isn't that great? Um, I like to think of potentiality as being more future looking, so forward looking. Um, and so that's almost kind of like a, trying to project the probability into the future. What would you say that they are, Venkat? Wait, let's stay with yours for a minute. So. It's interesting you think of probability as uh, sort of the numerator denominator of like past trials. So that's the experimental view of probability, right? And you can project it into the future as well. And you've talked about this a lot, the uh, David Deutsch possible worlds, uh, many futures kind of stuff, right? So there you have potentiality is basically the denominator. Would you agree? Like the number of ways the future could go, that's the denominator and the way it does go being the numerator. So in that sense, would they be connected? Yeah, in fact, I, well, I would say that the future is really hard. You can't ever get a probability on the future because the number of possible pathways is uncountable. So it is all potentiality. Okay, and it, the specific sort of metaphor here of the future being, are the possibilities and potentialities of the future being the denominator, does that work or? Yeah, they're uncountable though is the problem. Okay. It's like a soft number, whereas a probability you can like actually count the things, you know what mm -hmm. the total set is, whereas potentiality, you, you don't know what the set is. Okay, yeah. so I think my sense of the two is kind of related and I actually like to come at it from like um, uh, an actual example. So if you think about like potential in the sense of potential energy, especially something like, you know, water behind a dam, right? So you've got a dam and then you've got water behind it, that's potential energy. Mm -hmm. And if there's cracks in the dam that weaken it and at some point it's gonna like burst and come out, then it, you can think of like uh, the potential as sort of the probability that the dam will burst at some point and burst through, but you can't actually predict the specific crack that'll give way and, um, you know, cause the dam to burst. So it's like that's potentiality versus actuality. And I've always liked that metaphor because um, often like um, when you talk about predicting the future, people talk about like, you know, chaos theory and flapping butterflies and there's no way you could have predicted that. And that feels to me like a disingenuous statement because you can look at the cracks on a dam and just say, hey, that's a weak dam that's gonna burst some point. And then they'll say, uh, can you predict which crack will fail? And I'll say, of course I can't. But the fact that there's lots of cracks in the dam suggests that it's going to break at some point in the future, right? Right. So that's, and you could, yeah. And it's kind of cool. We can we can link probability to this dam thing by saying you could count up the number of cracks and say mm -hmm. that the probability of that one cracking is like maybe one out of however many cracks there are. But that assumes that you can see all the different cracks, right? That assumes that you can count all the number of cracks that there are to get a yeah. good probability. And uh, that's you could think of that as the finite and countable tip of the iceberg of like the infinite number of ways it could fail, right? Like that's just one measure of how weak the dam is, but there could be other things like hidden flaws in the concrete, maybe something else is going on. So you're right in your definition of the possible futures is uh, at least uncountably, or maybe countably infinite at least, depending on whether you take a digital view of the future or not, uh, but yeah. Uh, I think that's the relationship between potentiality and probability. Oh yeah, one, one more example I think sort of hammers the point home. Like um, I like the damn one for sort of the sort of visual sort of physicality of it. 
Another one is uh, weather prediction. So I read this in, um, uh, what's his name? The uh, 538 guy, his book, uh, The Signal and the Noise. Yeah. So Signal and the Noise, his book, um, he ha- he talks about, what was it in this? Yeah, that and I read it in another book too. But he talked about the early days of trying to predict the weather. And one of the interesting things about trying to predict the weather is you cannot predict the weather, but you can still predict the climate. And part of the reason why is um, longer term. So the one way to think of it is it's easy to predict the weather tomorrow and it's easy to predict the weather a hundred years from now. It's the middle that's a problem because for tomorrow you can just do like, you know, extrapolations of the way wind patterns are moving right now and it'll stay stable for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. For hundred years from now, you can look at the earth's mass balance and heat balance equations, which are again, kind of simple. It's in the middle that things get chaotic. And so I like to think of that as global warming, climate change is a potentiality based prediction. It's like, you know that input has to match output, otherwise something is heating up. So that alone is telling you things are heating up. Whereas short term prediction is more probability based. And in between you need to use some mix of potentiality and probability to make the prediction. Right, and this is kind of like, I mean, so we talked a little bit, I think about the stock market last week. Um, you can kind of interestingly tie this back to like price predictions, right? Like the value investor is basically saying, okay, I know the price is here today. And I know that in like 15 years, the price will be higher tomorrow, but figuring out like the potential where it's going to go in the meantime is very difficult and inexact science. Um, Yeah. And that's why like, um, financial advisors like, uh, yourself now, a newly minted financial advisor, uh, you guys talk a lot about like dollar cost averaging, right? Like if you want to like uh, forget about the day-to-day variations and you just want to bet on the fact that the stock market is likely to go up in 10 years, then you buy a little bit every day, like the same dollar amount every day, right? So when the stock is high, you buy less. When the stock is low, you buy more of it for the same $100 or whatever, yep. right? Yeah. And the, I mean, that kind of approach will really bite your butt in um, a down market and a long bear market. Um <laughs> So something that never recovers, you can end up just keep buying in on something that's going down. Um, if it ever turns around, you do great. But if it never turns around, well, that was not a very good strategy, was it? Um, so. Are there examples of people uh, getting screwed doing that? Do I know anyone that's gotten screwed doing it? Or just examples from history? Like, has there been a really long bear market in history where that has happened? Not that I know of. I'm not yeah. the most... I'm not the most up to speed on market history. Oh. Um, I have read, I think the, well, Michael Lewis has a great, I would say kind of semi-anthology about market crashes. I forget, oh, it's called Panic, I think. Um, but, but they tend to be short, looks like, like bear runs. If, if it's gonna happen, it turns into a quick crash very quickly. Like I, I can't think, I've heard of like long, long periods of slight deflation. And in fact, some people argue that that's actually the norm for markets over history, but a slight deflation doesn't actually, that would actually call appre- uh, cause appreciation in uh, uh, value, I guess. It's not the same thing as a long bear market where actual asset values are falling down. Hmm. Yeah. But if you pick the wrong stock, it doesn't. So if you're not dollar cost averaging into an index, you're dollar cost averaging into a single stock like Bitcoin, for example, in the bottom <laughs> stock um, and Bitcoin starts going down. then yeah, that would have been a losing strategy. As long as Bitcoin keeps going up, you're fine. And I mean, the stock market too. I mean, um, it has kept going up for a couple of hundred years. So Bitcoin is just a very young market by contrast. Uh, but in general, I would say like, yeah, I mean, we talked about weather and dams bursting and bubbles are kind of like that, right? Bubbles are things people think of as like a bundle of potential energy that's about to burst or something like exuberance, optimism, potential energy. Yeah, it's got a lot of potentiality to burst. Um, I'm trying to think is like, is there good probability when you're looking at a bubble? Is there also some like probability metric that you can use to look at it? Like, I guess if you go back and count all the other past bubbles? Is there like some metric you could use on a, you know, like bubble comparison? I'm not really sure. I think people do use some measures. Like for individual stocks, you might use something like earnings per share or uh, like price to equity ratio. But I don't know how you would like say a market overall is 
a bubble. And I think that's why it becomes like this kind of like superstitious science. And uh, my favorite line about bubbles is uh, like, uh, I forget who said it, but something like that guy has predicted 11 of the last five bubbles or something like that. And that's kind of it. It's like, even if you're right about the last five bubbles, if you over predicted and you called bubble too many times, then you're not really doing much prediction. You're just like making it a habit of like screaming warnings, right? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But, but that's interesting. Like, would you agree that the potentiality in a bubble is basically, uh, I guess what they call irrational exuberance, like human optimism more than anything else? Is that what a, the stuff of a bubble is? Yes, I think that's probably correct. The stuff of bubbles is optimism. Okay. But I also, I also, okay, I also think you can, I also think you can say the stuff of bubbles is, um, I think some amount of optimism derives from an overactive pattern matching. Tendencies have, it, mm -hmm. humans have a tendency to pattern match. Um, and yeah. you can kind of see this happen throughout history of like where we achieve one goal and then we kind of pattern match on goals around that that are very ambitious. And so the goals that we, pattern match on after the initial like discovery or advancement tend to stick around for a really long time as a narrative but they don't ever actually get like I would say firmly resolved in the same way that the first nice um concrete advancement is um you can see it happen other places like anyways um my favorite one is like we cured um we cured we discovered penicillin and mm -hmm. then we decided that we could cure cancer um, because we solved a whole bunch of illnesses with penicillin and the, the discovery of antibiotics. And that kicked off this enormous, huge, and I would almost claim slightly um, naive belief that we would have cancer eradicated in like the next 10 years. Um, and then society, especially the United States, devoted millions and billions of dollars at this point to attempting to cure cancer. Um, and this has like been a thing that we've been fixated on for a long time. And I, I claim that the cancer fixation, I mean, it's definitely a problem, don't get me wrong. I understand that it like affects millions of people and it's definitely a big problem. Um, but the belief that we could cure cancer and that this was like a achievable concrete goal that all we needed was time, energy and effort because the solution existed, I think you can say was a potentiality overmatch on solving um, the antibiotics problem. Yeah, and I think it actually goes deeper into like pattern matching across sort of the limits of a particular scientific paradigm because uh, antibiotics and penicillin, they're for infectious diseases. That's a class of diseases that works a certain way. Like, um, you know, bacterium or something gets into your body and you kill that, right? Whereas cancer is, I think there are some cases of cancer that have some relation to like infections, but in general, cancer is a different phenomenon altogether, right? And it requires a completely different scientific approach. Uh, I should mention this book I started trying to read, but it got too depressing, so I stopped. But it's apparently really good. It's called The Emperor of Maladies. I've it's about, it. uh, you've read it? Yeah. Oh, so yeah, you tell us about it then. Uh, what does that book conclude about cancer? I don't remember really. It's a really great book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we suck. <laughs> and it like yes this is I think so I think this is where my understanding of cancer funding comes from is this book and it talks oh, about okay. how it talks about the history of cancer research actually yeah I'm pretty sure some of my statements on the cancer project are like largely based around what I read in this book that I can't tell you exactly right now but this is where my primary mm -hmm. source research for this, this particular assumption comes from is um I think it's Siddhartha something maybe Mukherjee something like that is the author okay. of it. Um, we'll save it yeah. for... Um... Yeah, it's a great book. It's a really well-written history of cancer. Um, yeah, but anyways, so like, I think that, I think that um, at least like having lived through this like glass bubble that I would say sort of has ended this last week and started back maybe like October of last year, November, just this like recent run up and then down kind of thing. Um, it got really intense in like mid January. Things just seemed like they were really like hitting, and I just, I just kind of got this feeling watching people talk on Twitter, and then also you know talking to people in real life a little bit. Um, just this like sort of, it's gonna keep going up. It's been going up. Look at all these <laughs> other things that have gone up. This is gonna go up, and it's probably gonna hit like X. And it really just felt like we were taking 
what had happened in the last three weeks and applying it as like a pattern match thing to the next like and so it's using past patterns to predict potentiality when there's no like probabilistic or like any like number of cracks like that you can go count and actually derive a real potentiality from um so i would say that's like kind of where hopium comes in yeah it's um like uh, i'm looking right now and bitcoin is at 51 and um it's a, it crashed and it sort of has seems to have rebounded a little bit. So uh, it, that's kind of interesting because this time it has actually been a little bit of a pattern break. If you look at 2017 and 2013, the crashes there were like almost to pre high uh, sort of uh, levels. Whereas this time it's not actually collapsed as much. So it's like a positive break in the pattern. And, uh, but it's kind of interesting that it's still like all those people on Twitter making all those graphs of like, weird line and parabolic fits and shit like that. Like I thought like Elliott wave stuff was um, the limit of it, but apparently there's like a million theories like Elliott waves. Are you a big fan of Elliott wave type things? Have we talked about them before? Uh, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I think it's the whole where you say this is a head and shoulders pattern mm -hmm. and therefore it's going down or like, yeah, yeah. this is, I've got these. So basically the general idea for listeners who aren't really sure what we're talking about, and you might've seen this on the internet, it's someone will show like a volume. I think it's a volume graph and then it's also high, low, and then like end. So like the little candlestick, I think they're candlestick graphs. Candlestick graphs show the daily high, the daily low, or like period high, period low, and then period close, period open. Um, and then they're colored based on like where the open and close are in relation to each other. So if it closes lower than it open, then the candle would look red. If it closes higher than it opened, it would be green. Anyway, so someone will take one of these graphs and then using the high low kind of like points and the low low points, they draw some lines on the graph. So, you know, sometimes there's one that goes across the top if it's like a head and shoulders thing and then they do like a bottom line that's like, and then all the like the lowest points that it's been in the past week kind of turning upwards. And this means that there's a conjunction happening when Mars is semi squared to Mercury. And because of this, um, it's definitely a buy. <laughs> exactly. It's a kind of astrology. And I think I see where it stops being like meaningful thinking about like, potentiality and probability and turns into astrology, I think it happens when you start ignoring the content of what you're talking about. Like when you're talking about dams bursting, you're literally talking about water. And if you're actually interested, you can go look at the physics of water and how it builds up pressure. You can look at how stress develops in concrete and so forth. Whereas when, when people talk about like abstract technical analysis on markets and bubbles and shoulders and Elliott waves and things, like it's unmoored from any actual physics of potentiality and probability. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with you on that one. Okay. Um, I think that, I think that what these things are trying to get a handle on is they're trying to, I think they're trying to chart out past hope or past hopium or past like, because when, it, so when a stock trades at a price, that's someone thinking that it's gonna go higher than that, right? Or lower or whatever. So in some sense, I think what they're trying to do is figure out the potentiality of hopes and dreams of the past and where those might lead for the future. But it's only, it's like sheerly only based around like what they think like desires and demand are encapsulated okay. in the price chart, right? And it's just like clearly like trying to capture that human hopium amount that like is reflected. Okay, yeah. so that's fair. So uh, what you're saying is that to the extent bubbles are basically phenomena based on sort of amount of optimism, what you're calling hopium, then this is like uh, these technical analysis models kind of are almost models of like hope and optimism. And to the extent they're wrong, they're wrong because they don't capture everything else that's going on, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, Bitcoin is this totally abstract commodity that has no relation to anything fundamental, but it does live in a market with opportunity costs where other things that do represent real things live, right? So yeah. if you think steel, which is a real commodity with real users, has um, some sort of intertradable relationship with Bitcoin, then indirectly Bitcoin also acquires the characteristics of like hope about steel in particular, right? right? And steel in particular has 
constraints other than humans' hopes and fears about the future. There's other stuff affecting what yeah. happens to steel. Like physical reality and your ability to ship product to customers and how your union contract is like playing out negotiations for this next coming quarter, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, there's this like new, so there's a new indicator that it's kind of going around the options world that I don't really understand that well. It's something I want to understand more, but I think it's really interesting. It's developed by a woman named Lily, I think Frankham is her last name, um, called the NOPE in index. Um, and so like these charts, my understanding is that it uses option movements to figure out what the price will probably do. So it's using, instead of using, so the the what did you call them the franklin the frankenstein chart and oh, the elliott wave stuff the what? no was it the elliott wave stuff what do you mean frankenstein the wave chart? stuff the elliott yeah, wave yeah. elliott wave stuff right okay yeah. the elliott waves um so elliott waves uses as its data source the low high closes right low high and close open close mm -hmm. data and it makes kind of predictions off of that this other index, the NOPE index, uses um, options data. So where the options market is going for stock to try and figure out what they think the actual price will do. Part of that, I think, has to do with this whole thing that options are a, um, options use margin or a way of, um, they have like outsized impact on stock price because of the way that they're a hedge, like not hedge, is hedge the right word? Leverage, I mean, options have a lot of leverage because you know, leverage. $100 in options can move like $1,000 in price, so. Exactly, they're a leveraged, that's the word, thank you. They're a leveraged way of betting on the stock market. And so, I mean, so I would say that this is probably a better indicator than like volume because it does tell you the leverage move, right? And so like, if the levers move a little bit, then the stock market has so it is a better measure i think of potentiality of stock moves um rather than huh. uh, i i actually think it's not so much about potentiality but about predictability because mm -hmm. when you have like options in the market what you're saying is that at least a part of the future is predictable because people have like locked in options contracts that say certain things will happen so if you take that data as well as say algorithmic trading data like what the algorithms and like uh, high frequency traders kind of stuff are doing those kind of bring in a weird way a certain amount of predictability into part of the market because certain things are locked in but because of that they create volatility in other parts and um, uh, but but here's the thing I think is still missing because whether you're looking at options prices or the sort of base prices, you still don't solve what you call the pattern matching problem. The future is like the past kind of thing. And I think this is where the superstition comes in for a particular reason. Like uh, actually a good reference point is something like, you know, conspiracy theories like QAnon, right? Like look at how they update their priors when events don't match what they thought would happen. Like right until the last minute that Biden was inaugurated, the QAnon channels were chattering with, oh, it's just about to happen. The storm is going to happen. The Secret Service will swoop in and arrest Biden and everybody else just before the inauguration. And it's like, what world are you living in? And then the inauguration came and went, and those channels are still going. Yeah. They're still updating, making up theories like, oh, all this is actually set up and Biden is actually Trump's uh, sort of ally and this will all happen in 2024 when Trump gets reelected. Yeah. And here's what I think happens in this kind of mindset, which is you have like primarily a technical model that's admitted certain facts into the prediction model. So in the case of something like Elliott Wave, maybe the facts that have been uh, introduced into the model are past hope trends, like you called it, like, you know, past hope and optimism trends, that's in the model. But then something random happens, like, you know, the price of steel skyrockets because people are making more steel. And that's a new piece of information that comes into your model. And it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with stock prices or option prices. It's fundamentally new information that has to be priced. And then the test becomes you're superstitious if you accommodate it in a way that just sort of reinforces your priors. You say it's still going to go up because you do some rationalizing. On the other hand, if you look at it and say, all right, this new information means I have to throw away the model and make a new model, then you're actually looking at uh, reality. And I think a lot of the superstitious people, they don't change their conclusions when new information comes in. They sort of construct new explanations for the same conclusions with like the minimal tweaks possible, right? So 
uh, yeah, that's why I think, um, so in a way, potentiality is you have a model and it's sort of pumped up like a charged battery and then new information comes in and then you kind of have to update the model. Otherwise it sort of starts to leak potential in a way. Yep. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of like the whole game of the stock market is updating your model, right? When new information comes in, it's kind of interesting. I was thinking about this a little earlier, like, I don't know how much on the theme of probability and potentiality this is, but stock markets are like, to a large extent, they're kind of feedback machines. Like, mm -hmm. like the stock market information, how information moves the stock market. I think there's like a pretty standard, for the most part, like good news means the stock market goes up, you know, the stock price goes up. Bad news means the stock market price, go, the price of a stock goes down, sort of. Um, except around like sometimes there's companies where they thought they were going to do good and they did well, but they didn't do as good as people mm -hmm. thought they were going to do. So the stock price drops. Um, so anyways, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's like a feedback loop. There's like a feedback loop in the stock market such that the ground is always changing. So it's like kind of like an environment that's constantly evolving um, and predicting which way it's going to evolve is really hard to do because of the feedback loops. But I guess that's like very similar to like the butterfly, right? The reason that like the butterfly beating its yep. wings is hard to predict is that it kicks off a large series of feedback loops. Well, right? it's not just feedback loops because feedback loops can be simple and predictable. It's uh, feedback loops that make the system like um, complex and chaotic. So the butterfly, it makes it sens sensitive to initial conditions so that small perturbations in the beginning can cause like really large, um, uncertainties far in the future, right? Um, but can we tie feedback loops to like potentiality? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I think um, one of us should have come up with this like 25 minutes ago because I think both of us know this quote. It's that famous line by I think Benjamin Graham or somebody, which is in the short term, the market is a voting machine and the long term, it's a weighing machine. Have you heard this line? No. Oh, so you should look this up. I think it's a classic uh, from like, uh, so yeah, it's a famous investing book. But yeah, in the short term, the market is a voting machine. So basically a popularity contest, contest of um, hope and dreams and pessimism. So it's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. That's when sort of fundamentals and uh, new information is actually priced in. So this actually fits into our pr prediction versus potentiality uh, model because voting is like prediction and weighing is like uh, potentiality, right? Roughly, that sounds right to me because voting is not just like who you want or what you want to um, happen, that's elections and politicians, but voting in the stock market is what you think everybody else will do. So you're doing predictions. So you're voting with predictions, but 100 years out, you're not gonna do that. So the things that get factored out as noise and then accumulate a signal, that becomes the weight. So it's a weighing machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I'll look up who said that. I think it was Benjamin Graham. Do you think there's other systems that exhibit the same behavior? Short term, it's a voting machine. Long term, it's a weighing machine. Hmm. I think culture does. So like, you know, in the short term, which movie is popular or which TV show is popular is kind of like a voting machine. But in the long term, like things that become recognized as classics, that's a weighing machine, right? Like look at 90s television shows now, like Friends for whatever reason was huge then, but today is like kind of in the doghouse. But Seinfeld, I think has retained some of its, uh, uh, I don't know, salience. So weighing machine, Seinfeld won. Voting machine, Friends won, but then lost the weighing machine. So I think that works that way. It's interesting because your weighing machine, I would claim, is weighing the same thing. It's value, right? Like it's long-term something, something. What is like, you know, it's like. I mean, it's value itself can have a time horizon, right? Like maybe friends had like jokes that kind of like landed in 1997, but they didn't land in 2020. Whereas Seinfeld maybe makes more timeless jokes. I don't know. So, I mean, you could say like that, you could, you could say like more timeless companies are the ones that like end up coming out on the weighing machine. So there is a certain amount of timelessness, right? Like factor. Yeah. And in a way that is the judgment, like 
Mm-hmm. The fact that they win the weighing machine contest is what makes them timeless. Like there's no objective way to judge it. It's just pure survival, right? Mm, I see. But I guess like the real trick is, can you figure out what the timeless things are in today, right? Like, can you look at all the new things that are coming out and say, is this timeless? So is that like a, I mean, maybe that's a measure of potentiality, right? Yeah. And I think uh, I would bet on, in general, the answer is no. So in general, if you bet, if you and I were to pick five things today that we think will still be, uh, you know, important and popular 20 years from now, I think uh, we'll be able to do a good job of like saying what will not be relevant, but of the things that we say are relevant, I think our hit rate will be like random, basically. You think so? Should we yeah. try it? Are we gonna, are we gonna make, pick, pick like maybe three things? All right, let's pick, um, okay, one thing that's not going to be, uh, that's gonna go away in like 10 years and one thing that's gonna be bigger in 20 years and one thing that's gonna be smaller in 10 years. Okay, no. hang on, let me make sure I understand. We have one thing that's going to be bigger in... 10 years. So. 10 years. Bigger in 20 years, and then smaller in 10 years. No, bigger in 10 years, smaller in 10 years, but still important, but just reduced importance. And then something that's a total fad, as in it'll be completely forgotten by then. So one fad, one important thing, one important thing, one sort of not that important, but still around thing, and then a fad. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say the important thing is gonna be Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna say the important thing is gonna be climate tech. It's gonna get more important as in, yeah, more important. Mm. All right, so reduced importance. Uh, reduced importance, but still around. I think, um, mm, uh, I wanna say electric cars. <laughs> okay. So you're basically betting against my increased importance because uh, electric cars are part of climate tech. Maybe. Hmm. I'm having trouble formulating exactly what I think what's going to happen with those. I think I think they'll be like the water, but I don't think they'll be very important. Okay. Uh, my reduced importance one will be the US dollar. So it'll become slightly less important in rel- relation to today, but it'll still be like hugely important. All right. And one complete fad that people seem to think might endure, but you think will totally go away. This is hard. Um, I feel like I'm gonna hurt someone's feelings with this. I don't know. (laughs) Um, I kind of want to say NFTs. Okay. I don't actually think they're going in a way, but I think in 10 years from now, it'll look a lot different. Like different enough that we wouldn't be calling them NFTs anymore. There'll be some sort of descendant that's more important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's a fair kind of prediction where you're saying the specific manifestation today is a fad. Yeah. Okay. I, let's see. Huh. I, I'm actually torn between TikTok and Clubhouse. So the categories of media they represent. And initially I was going to say TikTok, but I think TikTok actually there's a there there, as in like, you know, all the cute little dance performances and things like that. I think that'll grow into something big. So TikTok, I think will actually be one of my stay around, maybe not as important things. Um, But I think Clubhouse will go away because I have a feeling it's popular only because of uh, uh, the pandemic where people can't actually gather in person for their like, you know, salon style conversations and conferences. So it's almost like a pandemic fad and I have a feeling it's going to burst. We'll see. Are you still (laughs) not on Clubhouse? uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I think Twitter is uh, starting something called Twitter Spaces to compete. Uh, yeah, in general, I think it's pandemic tech, and when life goes back to normal, it won't be as important. Yeah, life isn't going back to normal. It will. For this particular use case, it will. I don't think it all right. Yeah, that's see. my tenure prediction. We will see. All right, great. Well, Venkat, as always, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Uh, see you next Hi. week. See you next week, Lisa. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. 
Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.